Tammy Rockhold is our next speaker. She's graciously agreed to come and uh, give us a wonderful presentation today. As a registered nurse for over 25 years, Tammy has gained invaluable experience and knowledge in acute hospital nursing care. She spent time in many areas, including the emergency room, critical care unit, neonatal intensive care unit, and labor and delivery. In 1990, due to a serious ski accident, which left her with significant physical issues and prevented her from working in the hospital setting, she became a registered nurse auditor for several insurance claim auditing firms. In 1997, utilizing her auditing experience, she turned her attention to the formation of health cost management. As president of health cost management, she watched her company grow to, a, to be a significant competitor in the medical review business. In September 2010, health cost management was acquired by ExamWorks, Inc. At the present time, Tammy is continuing her practice as a nurse consultant, reviewing medical records and bills, and testifying as a medical billing expert witness. In addition, she is now representing Inform Software Corporation, a provider of automatic fraud detection software. Welcome, Tammy, and thank you. Hello, everyone. Is everyone awake and ready to learn a little bit about medical billing fraud? Thanks. Is there a curse? Is there a pointer? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. I know that. What I've got about forty-five minutes, or do I have that long? Yes. Okay. You do. All right. Uh, what I want to go over is evaluating medical costs and personal injury cases. One thing that I think you all need to really be very happy about is that you are in California, and I think California is one of the leaders and looking at what's a reasonable value. That seems to be the big thing is what is a reasonable value. I do work on both sides. Uh, medical, the numbers are the numbers is what I like to say. And I have plaintiff attorneys that are telling me that the Howell and Kornbaum and Cuevas, you know, all these case laws, it's just the gift that keeps on giving to the defense, nothing to the plaintiff. So I guess that's good, right? <laughs> Okay, we're going to go over two categ uh, categories of personal injury cases, billing and coding issues, some of it from the big picture, professional fee fees, inpatient hospital stays, surgery centers, and other fees. And what I really want to get at is the reasonable value and the amounts paid. A lot of you audit, you're looking at your plaintiff's medical bills, correct, for your job. How many of you look at your own medical bills and your own family's medical bills? Couple, three? Have you ever found an error? Whose error was the side on? It's almost always on the provider side. There are actually classes out there on how to get ten to $15,000 more per work comp injury or auto accident. Ask your doctor next time when you go to the doctor about uh, provider management classes. Okay, the first type is the legitimate injuries. You've got legitimate injuries, you've got legitimate providers, and the plaintiff has health insurance. Now that's really good because it's very simple. It's very easy is, you know, your paralegal can do it or you can do it if you're good with Excel. I'm not good at, with Excel, but um, you can put, you know, what's been billed versus what's been paid, contractual write-off, and see if there's any balance due. The second type are what I am seeing where I'm retained on an ongoing basis. And I'm very fortunate enough to have one of my colleagues and a good cohorts, uh, Bonnie is here with me today. So she's a nurse consultant that works with me. And also for any of you attorneys that want MCLEs afterwards, uh, we need you to fill out an evaluation form. And Stephen is here from exam work, so I just wanted to let you know that. But the second type that I'm seeing on an ongoing basis are your questionable or exaggerated injuries, attorney-directed care. To me, that sucks. I, to me, it's just really not okay. And then treatment that's on a lean basis where the person has some kind of health coverage. And of course, many of these cases are a combination. Many times I will see where the person has gone to the hospital via ambulance and the ambulance in the emergency room are being billed to the health carrier or Medi-Cal or Medicare, but then all the subsequent treatment is all done on lean basis. Okay, I've, we're looking at just the first category and I don't think that's why you're probably here today. Um, 
starts with record retrieval. I know there's a lot of bill review uh, or record retrieval companies out there, but you need to hold their um, hold them uh, responsible because you want to make sure you get a final statement, and this is from each treatment provider. And that means the amount billed and the amount paid and contractual write-off. And have the hospital actually put final statement for this date to stay. Look at the statement summary. You want to make sure that there's been amounts paid, written off, and final balance are included. Now, what a key for you is oftentimes hospitals and treatment providers will do interim billing. So sometimes you won't get that final statement. That you don't see anything that's been written off, that's when you need to push back on your record retrieval company and say, I need a final statement. It's very clear here, this person still had coverage. I want a final statement from the provider. And there should not be any subsequent cost for that because that's what you're paying for initially. Uh, this time, tabulate the information, amounts paid, written off, and balance due. You have a valid HAL number, good to go. Everyone's familiar with HAL? Everyone not, anyone not? I think, okay, how? Um, attorneys are probably much better at explaining this than what I am, but my understanding from a nursing uh, perspective is that case law in California is that how is the amount that's been billed versus amount paid versus contractual write-off versus balance due. And the amount that's been paid is your re reasonable value. Uh, I actually it was for Lobal and Lynch. Um, I understand that Sunny Blomquist is out on a wonderful Caribbean cruise, and she's the one that uh, got me talked into doing this presentation. And so I can't, she's not even here to give her a bad time, but it was just great because I had a deposition with her. It was very interesting because one of the the plaintiff attorney was from the state of Washington he was asking me all these questions well why did you write this off that's not reasonable why'd you write this off and I was like I think uh, count defense counsel needs to explain what the case law is in California but um, anyway it was very interesting because it was like if he's gonna file a lawsuit in California he better learn California's case law right Okay, handling the sec second category, I think that's why we're here, where you need to evaluate the reasonable value of medical care. From here on out, we're gonna cover billing and coding issues, professional fees, inpatient hospital stays, and surgery centers and other fees. And but a lot of you are finding that your co-pays, your out-of-pocket, all of that has, is going up. And so how many of you want to try to reduce that? Is there anyone that wants to pay full sticker price? Okay, well, we're gonna learn how to do that. And it's amazing what you can negotiate. Okay, first thing that I want you just, I'm talking about is upcoding of exams, spinal injections, unnecessary lab tests, time physical therapy mod modalities. What I wanna give you here it's just some low-hanging fruit. So you see some of this stuff, you're going to know that that's not okay. Okay, how many of you are familiar with E&M codes, evaluation management codes? Okay, it, that's what you get when you go to your doctor. And I'm just going to go over things from a high level because I, we've got a lot of information to cover. But if you've got a code that is ending in a four or five, that is a high level acuity. If it ends in a 99205, the American Medical Association, who is who puts out these codes, actually puts in writing in their book that that person needs to be in dire distress or near death. Now, when I see a chiropractor billing a 99205, I just almost want to burst out giggling. But it's very powerful when you go to court and you can show that and someone's gone tootling out of a provider's office, they did not, that's definitely upcoding. Okay, so here are the things that have to be included for your 99204, 99205, 99244, 99245. And how many times do you see 
a chart note that has all of this done. There's, I, I would say, one in 10,000. Okay, you also want to look at the minimal and low risk of significant complications, morbidity, and mortality. Now, if you look at presenting problems, you'll see here that a simple sprain strain is low. A simple sprain strain does hurt. I mean, it really can affect your activities of daily living. It is not a good thing, but you're not going to die from it. Where if you go on to the level of risk on the next page, where you look at some of these things, um, this is actually moderate. And what I think is interesting here is the AMA actually says that elective majory, elective majory open percutaneous or endoscopy with no identifiable risk factors, meaning that someone doesn't have heart disease, some kind of pre-existing comorbidities, that's just moderate. It's not even high risk. But look at some of these presenting problems with a heart attack, pulmonary embolus, you've got uh, severe psychiatric uh, psychosis. You look at some of those, any of those can be fatal. So the main thing you want to look at is can I die from this? You know, and if you can't die from it, you probably do not need, you cannot be billing with a high level of valuation management code. Here is what you need for your musculoskeletal exam. And it looks complicated, but when you boil it down, it really is not. You know, is the history at the right level? Is exam at the right level? And is the decision making at the right level? And so main thing is if you see, if the answer is no for any of these questions, then the number should be ending at a three. And some people will come back to me and say, well, I'm just, you know, an attorney or I'm just the paralegal. And what I want you to be aware of is it's okay for you to question those prices be, or those uh, codes because those codes are very specific. They're put out by the American Medical Association and there's very specific criteria that has to be met. Okay, how many of you are seeing outrageous prices for spinal injections? I mean, like through the roof, it's t like totally nuts. And what I tell people, what I'm testifying to a jury, I will say, it is not illegal for a treatment provider to bill whatever he wants. A Ford dealership can bill $150,000 for a Ford Focus. Is that reasonable? No, everyone understands that. Then the same doc, a doctor cannot bill $1,000 for just a you know, very simple exam. So here's just your spinal injections. The main thing that I'm seeing where with flora, uh, spinal injections is billing it for too many levels and the unbundling of the fluoroscopy guidance. And since I've got the skeleton up, what I want you to look at is that if someone has an injection, like a, let's say C2, C3, C4, a C2 to C3, C3 to C4, C4 to C5, they are injecting the levels between the spine. So you will see many times where it says C2 to C3, C3 to C4, C4 to C5, and so that sounds like five levels, or th I'm sorry, four levels, correct? But they are not, pain management doctors are not injecting the spinal column, they're injecting the space in between. So that would be actually three spaces. And so what you will find, I would say in 25% of your reviews, when you're looking at the spinal injections, you'll see where they build for too many levels. The one that I see unbundled all the time is fluoroscopy. Now fluoroscopy, and fortunately the AMA has finally caught up, but um, myself, would you want anyone futzing with your back without fluoroscopy? You know, and so that's why most of the codes actually do include fluoroscopy. And so here are some codes, and a lot of these have actually been changed in 2017. Um, red flag code to me for spinal injections is a 7703 and a 72275, which is epidurography. Those two can never be billed together. How many of you have heard of unbundling? Um, if someone has epidurography, the fluoroscopy is already included in that. And epidurography, the 72275, always requires a separate report. 
Okay, here's some changes for 2017. Again, I'm not going to go over them specifically because you've got this as your handout, but there have been significant changes in the codes for 2017. Okay. Uh, also, 77003, what was that? Fluoroscopy. It cannot be billed with any of the new codes, which includes 62320 through 62327. It's also not okay to build fluoroscopy with all of these codes. And so think about all these codes that you see for your uh, different kinds of injections, your epidural steroid injections, your facade injections. These are, a lot of them are being billed with the 77003 that's already included in the original procedure. Who puts out those rules? American Medical Association. And then so you've got the, uh, they're unbundling, the pain management doctor is unbundling the, Pain, uh, the fluoroscopy, you've got the surgery center unbundling the fluoroscopy, and you're looking easily at $5,000 over that already, I call it double billed per injection. This one, this one we were talking about, um, is it's the billing of too many levels. And I would say easily 20 to 30% of the files I review, and it doesn't have to be from bad providers, it can be from good providers. By the way, I call um, some of the quote unquote bad providers, I call them frequent, frequent flyers. And, um, but you take the number of levels is one less than the number of vertebrae listed. So if you've got C2, C3, C4 mentioned in the report, that means that two levels were injected. Does that make sense? Because that's something that's really, you know, if you're looking at your own chart notes or any kind of plaintiff, that's something I really want you to look at. Unnecessary lab tests. This is something that I'm starting to see in California, and I want you to really start being aware of it and maybe passing it on to your carriers. And the reason is, is I do a lot of work with some of the SIUs as well as FBI, and I was just working with a major carrier. It was actually Allstate, and in Medicare and Allstate got, I want to say like a over huge amount, the $600 million verdict against um, Millennium, Millennium Insurance. And you can check it out, it's federal, it's national news, and they utilize 600 of my reports. And a lot of the things that you see with some of the labs, they don't look that uh, major because it's a simple blood test or urine test for checking for someone if they're you know abusing drugs, but instead of just having like a $60 urine test or $120 blood test, you'll see that there is going to be all these multiple charges that are just crazy that total sometimes $1,500 to $2,000. And again, because it's kind of low on the radar, it doesn't really stand out. So I really, really want you to start looking at that. So if you see codes build with these 80300 to 80377, that's probably a major red flag. And just because I feel so strongly about trying to help you get on top of that, I will do a couple of these at no charge for your carrier because it's something I really want you to start looking at. And I'm not going to go into all the documentation, but there is specific documentation requirements for definitive drug testing. Okay, if any of the required documents are missing, the tests are not compensable. And it's not uncommon for the required documents to be missing. And most of all, there has to be a doctor's order. And like I said, I do a lot of work with Allstate SIU. This was actually from one of my SIU claim reps where he said, I was at a so social function that a plaintiff attorney was at who didn't know his occupation. He was bragging about getting involved in opening a UDS lab in Michigan because it was liquid gold. LOL, I kid you not. This is incredible, the abuse we see in these charges and unbundling and billing for unnecessary services. Is that crazy? There's actually, and I don't know if I have it here, I do not have it here, but if you want it, um, send me an email and I can send you a link to a website that actually tells you how to set up your own drug company. And uh, it's, it's unreal. All you have to do is get some doctors to sign on and you become very wealthy. Okay. Um, 
Physical therapy modalities. This is something that I'm seeing a lot of issues with physical therapy. I'm not going to go into each of these again because there is so many, but each of these codes here, each of these codes that are listed in these three rows are what we call time modalities. That means that the physical therapist cannot just put a check mark for, I'm gonna say like massage, which is 97124. The physical therapist or chiropractor has to document the amount of time, like 15 minutes or 25 minutes. Otherwise, these time modalities are not considered compensable. Going too fast, or are we okay? Okay, for professional fees, there's two solid books that are available. And one thing that I really encourage you to do is actually purchase one of these, not just for your office, but also for your own personal use. And one is based on Fair Health. One's based on Fair Health database, and the other one's based on Contacts for Healthcare database. And what's really good about these databases is they are based on what treatment providers in local geographic regions bill out. Not what they're paid, but what they bill out. And you'll see that both books have pricing at the 50th, 75th, and 90th percentiles. Also Medicare pricing. And you know you can see where it's very geographically specific. The fee analyzer, which is based on health, uh, Fair Health, has California into 37 geographic zones. Medical fees has California into nine geographic zones. So what that means is that, especially the fee analyzer, that is very, very specific. So a doctor in Merced is going to be rated differently than a doctor that is in Fresno. And the reason I'm encouraging you to maybe purchase one of these books or just go to www.fairhealth is you can see, you can put in a CPT code of what your doctor has billed and let's say you're out of pocket, you know, some people have a out of pocket of like $8,000 and you can put, find out what your doctor has billed and say, call them up and say, you're really kind of billing high. What do you think about reducing it to this? And you'd be surprised 90% of the time you will be able to get a discount with your first phone call. Uh, my husband had the unfortunate experience of being in the hospital and our out of pocket was not that much, but for the hospitalization, the hospitalization, our out of pocket was going to be $8,000. And you know, the whole hospital stay was like 70,000. So that doesn't seem like a lot, but that's for me, a chunk of change. And it was like, there's no way I'm going to pay the hospital that much money because uh, again, I'll show you where you can look up to see a hospital's income statement of what they bill versus what they actually collect. Guess how much hospitals in California actually collect on average here in California? 15 to 30% is the average. And we'll show you the website where you can look it up. But again, I called on my husband. I said, you know, I'd like to tell you that I'll do a prompt pay discount. I do medical bill auditing. I'm just really upfront. Um, so we've got out of pocket of $8,000. And I would like to share with you that, you know, we'll offer 3000 today for a prompt pay discount. That means I'll give you a credit card today, you know, and then worse clean. Well, they said, oh, the, you know, you, you're really funny. You know, maybe hospitals in big cities do this, but hospitals in small towns don't do this. And anyway, I said, well, please let your patient accounts manager know which the name I expect to call back in 48 hours. And I got a call back in 20 minutes and they said, will you take 4,000 as a prompt and final? And it's like, yes. <laughs> so now the book, or if you look on Fair Health and I want you all to write down www.fairhealth. There is a free version for people, just general population. This was actually started so people can be more aware, more transparent about their healthcare costs. But the pricing that is given represents the amount that the treatment provider should have billed for their medical services. Now, how many providers actually get paid what they bill? That's an oxymoron, correct? And so if you're looking at commercial payors, and this is something I have testified to in California multiple times, as has Bonnie, is that you will look at the usual and customary pricing, I will say is sticker price. The reasonable amount 
based on what commercial payers is 30 to 60% of those amounts. Questions on that? Okay, I'm just gonna give you some things that you can go through that you know I've kind of tried to gather myself as far as looking at Medi-Cal. You can download them and it's very easy to look up by the CPT code. Uh, California workers' comp. I do not like work comp. It is, uh, does not make sense to me. California work comp is, <laughs> uh, they are still following some of the rules from 1990. Um, my recommendation is if you want to try it, go for it. If you uh, let it's successful, let me know. But generally, when I get something assigned to me for workers' comp, I just assign that to exam works because it really, the time it would take me is 10 times as long as what it would take exam works. Um, inpatient stays, American Hospital Directory, and this is something that I encourage every office to have, has useful information for inpatient stays. Any hospital that provides Medicare to a patient has to provide all of their financial information on a yearly basis to Medicare, to CMS. And what the hospital supplies to CMS is actually their cost of what it costs them to do that care. Medicare covers the cost of doing service. Not any profit, but the cost of doing their service. So it gives you a really good baseline. And again, I'm not going to go into it real in depth, but the annual subscription for a single user is $395, which to me is just, um, you can get one paralegal, I think you would probably pay for yourself in you know, a couple cases as far as what information you get. Uh, we're here in Sacramento, so I thought this might be fitting to look at um, UC Davis. So what we have here is we have the inpatient revenue that is $4,787,000,000. We have eight outpatient revenue, which is two billion seven hundred ninety million. So I just bring up Excel as my friend, right? Total patient revenue; those two add up to seven million seven billion five hundred seventy-seven million dollars. Look at what they actually say again. Look at what they actually collect. They collect one billion five hundred sixty million. That's 20.6% of what they bill out. So can you see where hospitals billing, I call it funny money. It's like rolling the dice in Las Vegas. So that's why I encourage you that, you know, you should be able to start getting discounts immediately just on if you purchase this American Hospital directory, you know, and it's something that I think every bill review person should have. What's also good about AHD, American Hospital Directory, is you can look up how many times are we seeing like cervical fusion without complications with complications. So inpatient stays, even if there's an itemized billing, are assigned what's called DRGs, Diagnosis Related Groups. And so what this does is this tells you, this is UC Davis again, for each year, the number of inpatient stays, the average length of stay, the average charges, average payment, and the average cost. Is that telling or what? I mean, for 2015, there was, what, 28 cases. Average length of stay was a little over two days. Average charges is, let's say, 212,000. And then average payment is 26,000. And their cost of what they actually send to CMS is $32,000 to provide the care. Is that really telling or what? Questions on that? Why? Say again? Why? Why? If we had the answer, if I had the answer for that, I would probably be able to so help solve our healthcare crisis. Um, I personally believe that if we were looking at fraud, and I'm not getting into that all that today, but if we were looking at fraud alone, we would not have the healthcare crisis that we are in right now. Right now, it's I just participated and did my first grand jury indictment in Los Angeles, and we put 15 doctors in jail. But why they're doing it? is crazy. The thing is, you know, I'm just looking at this within the context of 
Paul Ryan, uh, you know, Paul Ryan, you know, who is, uh, you know, trying to solve our, our health care uh, crisis is, is a real advocate of uh, uh, medical savings plans. And medical savings plans can only work if, uh, if there's transparency and cost you know, and knowing what physicians actually charge. Right. So everything that I've seen here, you know, you're, what you talk about and things that I've seen anecdotally in my own work, tell me there, there is no transparency in, in, in uh, health care and no person can actually get uh, information on, on being able to shop you know, comparing apples, apples, oranges, oranges when it comes to their own health care. It's getting better, but as far as the availability, you were right. It is difficult to get, but it is there. I mean, I want you to check out www.fairhealth.com, and you'll see that you can start challenging some of your own physicians. But the amount of fraud that goes on, to me, is just totally nuts. And it's almost like when I'm looking in the fraud, and I just was an invited speaker for the International Association of Special Investigation Units. But to me, I'm hearing uh, investigators and even the FBI talk about hard fraud and soft fraud. And to me, it's like, to me, fraud is fraud. And it's like being pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. So anyway, <laughs> that's my own analysis. <laughs> but what? Say, they will say that hard... Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the question was, is what's the difference, or the definition of hard, hard fraud versus soft fraud? Hard fraud is when their provider and everyone is actually well aware of it. They're wanting to do something all together. It's like a planned, staged event. Soft fraud is where it's like, well, we can just kind of, let's see what we can get, get away with. But to me, it's, it's fraud. Good questions. I wish we could solve the healthcare crisis. I mean, you know, I never, I never thought I'd be in favor of a single payer system. I don't know what the answer is, but I do look at. I work part time for a company out of Germany called Inform, and I look at their healthcare outcomes, and they pay less than what we do for their healthcare. And there, we are, United States is like number eighteen on world healthcare outcomes. Okay, well, do they have billing practices like you are demonstrating here? They do not have billing practices like what we do as far as the individual CPT codes. They do have the DR, the diagnosis codes, the ICD, the diagnosis codes. So, and there's fraud that does occur with that as well. Okay, um, this is something that if you want to know how to actually download some of this information, these are actually some instructions for you to be able to download it. And this is what, anytime you're doing, getting a bill from a hospital, always make sure you ask for the UB04 form. That is a standard summary billing for inpatient hospitalization. It's where it's got the room and board, your lab, and it's got the summary bill. That will give you a lot of information. And the DRG number is found on the uh, box 71. All these boxes do actually mean something. <laughs> and then you start the PC Pro Pricer Program, uh, CMS, and again, this is all free, which is good. And then you enter the provider number. Every hospital has their own individual provider number. And then you fill out the data interest screen as far as how much was billed. And this is what a DRG cost for hospital stay at UC Davis. So you can see here we've got the hospital number. And then this is what was billed. And then right here, this amount is the amount that UC Davis has submitted to CMS that it costs them to do that service. And so what I do for a reasonable value Everyone utilizes Medicare as a basis because they are the largest payer of healthcare claims in the United States. And for reasonable value, I take 250% of Medicare. So I multiply that number times 2.5 for a reasonable value. And that's something that you guys can do right now on your own without having to hire Bonnie or myself to start negotiating some of your own claims. 
And the reason I picked 2.5 is I tried to be reasonable. And most commercial payors pay 150 to 200 percent. And I go at 250 percent again just to be reasonable. And how many of you are aware of the case law that just passed for out of network providers, I believe July 1st of this year in California? Gold versus Royal. If you give, if you leave me your card, I'll send it to you. It's Gold or G O E versus Royal. And it's actually where they are saying the amount of, for, and what's happening a lot is let's say that you know that you're going to a doctor you're, uh, for arthroscopy. So your doctor is in network, so is your hospital, but then you get this huge humongous bill from an anesthesiologist that you have no control over because you're out to lunch and it's 10 times what is usual and customary. Your insurance company pays X and leaving you with a bill of Y. Anyway, read this. Uh, if you can't find it, let me know. But what I will do is it actually says that it's either usual and customary or 125% of Medicare. So it's giving, it's really exciting to see the credibility for the methodology that I utilize. Work comp pricing for inpatient stays is again something different. And then um, so is Medi-Cal pricing and surgery centers. Um, surgery centers you can get with a database, but also you can download things and again use Medicare as your baseline. Um, after looking at the coding issues, you know, you'll see where there's a lot of issues as far as upcoding and unbundling of some of the different things. And Medicare for durable medical, durable medical equipment is also fairly high. Um, how many of you have different tiers for your insurance for different drugs? Okay. I really encourage you, and this is something that's free, is to sign up for one of these um, prescription drug, and look at here, whoop. This one is pscard.com, and all you do is enter the um, medication, the dollar amount, and I used to get in trouble all the time, not in trouble, but uh, push back from opposing counsel when I would say that this uh, person is on the $4 a month plan at Walmart. It would be, well, like, well, my patient, my client lives 20 miles from uh, Walmart. Well, you can do this. So this is five miles within the address of where you live. And there's another one that's ParamountRx.com. And let me go to, whoop. I guess you... We've covered a lot of information today, haven't we? Okay, so um, all of you, I think, got in your booklet a couple extra handouts. And what I want you to do is just take a look-see at them really quickly. And I believe it, there's not a page number, but it's at the very end of my presentation where the first one actually has Ambien, this is a medication for sleeping. I'm sure some of you've heard of that. And this is actually within five miles of where I live. And look at the brand price, the generic price, and look at Safeway Pharmacy, uh, $15 versus $82. So can you see where that can make a difference? I mean, I, sh I use this for my own co-pays. And then if you go to the next page, um, my husband's on blood pressure medication called Benacar, and look at CVS Pharmacy is $150, but then uh, CVS, Safeway Pharmacy and Costco are $215. And then you, the last one is cyclobenzaprine. Uh, probably you see that a lot, where Walgreens is $71, and then CVS is $85, Costco is $121. So I'm just letting you know that um, I have a client right now that um, takes Viagra, and that is not on 
you know, most health plans don't cover that. And within a five mile radius of where he lived, there was a price for the generic Viagra of $60 to $400. So what I just really want you to know is you're, I'm talking about, I'm hearing lack of transparency, but there are tools out there. It's just not as prevalent as what it should be. And so I just want to close with handling the second category. Now that we have reasonable value from how is that what you want to do is medical damages, which is what I'm here to talk to you about, are the lesser of reasonable cost for medical care or amounts paid or incurred. And is, it, is there Tom here from San Francisco? Tom Sawyer? Yes. No, he's not here today. Okay. He wrote a really good article, so make sure you get that from him as well. But um, I just think that you've got some really good tools out there, but like you said, there is lack of transparency. We're trying to help you so you know more about shopping for your own health care than you do on buying a car. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tammy. That was a very interesting presentation. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank you to everyone uh, that is here today and everyone on the webinar. We're going to sign off on the webinar right now. And unfortunately, we're going to go have some snacks and cocktails. Uh, we wish you were all here. Um, if you have any questions about anything today, please contact me. I can point you in the right direction of any of the speakers. Um, you can find Kurt or Charlie or me um, on our, through our website. Uh, and, um, and again, I just uh, want to thank everyone. And uh, soon the videos uh, that were taken today will be up on our website. So if any of your colleagues, uh, you think they would be interested in any of the subject matter, they can, um, they can log in and watch them at their leisure. Unfortunately, not for any credit, but, um, but for the information. So thanks again, and uh, we'll enjoy talking with you after, and hope to see you next year. Thank you.